there's a way to make an entrance. This is my destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. What up, y'all? You're part of the big boy, big boy's neighborhood, Rhymecology, huh? A lot of people need to uh, step back and really figure out what Rhymecology is, man. Just the art of rhyming, bro. And not just that, man. We live this thing called hip hop. Well, a lot of us do, and if you're living it right. And under hip hop, man, there's so many things also, man. When I had a chance to really talk about Rhymecology, just the mental awareness as well, man. The things that sometimes we don't even figure out what an outlet is. And I've been to juvenile halls where they give them like writing programs as well, man. And you don't know what's inside of you until you start like really kind of peeling this onion, these layers of emotions off, man. So with Rhyme College, it's not just about stacking rhymes. It's not just about how dope rhymes are, but also it can be very therapeutic as well, man. And aside from that, to a lot of people out there, this isn't disrespect, man, but some of us just need to write better rhymes too. You know what I'm saying? So, and I'm gonna tell you, I was gonna start kicking a freestyle, but then I really don't want Jeff to dissect uh, my bars. So, Rhyme Ecology, hello. My name is Jeff Walker, uh, stage name Jay Walker, and I created Rhyme College. By the way, I, I'll be participating with you guys just so you know I'm not like, Sitting up here all bougie, like, hey, you guys do it on. No, I participate. Who's comfortable having their rhyme read by someone else? Can I get can I get two snaps if we're ready? Two snaps if we're ready. Thank you. All right, all right, welcome to Rhyme Ecology. This is the art of rhyming. Just to break the ice, I think I'll do a little, uh, a little poem. What I want you to do is kind of listen to where the rhymes fall. Listen to what type of rhymes there might be in there. Are they just end rhymes? Are there internal rhymes? Are they just one syllable, et cetera, et cetera. So we're gonna get our mind thinking like that. Don't take your uniqueness for granted. Don't let the new branches replace the original roots that were planted. You see, we're all a part of the universal energy on this planet, but unless your whole soul knows exactly what you're about, nobody's going to understand it. In other words, don't sell out. Don't sell out the heritage you inherited on your first birthday. Don't sell out the genes you got in your genes, even though sometimes I know you want to fit in in the worst way. The last time I checked, DNA does not get rusty. No matter how bad you want to change and rearrange so you can fit the strange world of pop culture, you're still you. Trust me. It's rhymecology, you know? It's just, it's taking the art of rhyming, blended it with the, the science of, psych of psychology and mental health, and using hip hop as a vehicle for uh, self-empowerment, um, and using vehicle, using hip hop as a vehicle to, to help youth, you know, youth of all types, at risk youth, youth of all different kinds of communities, and to help those who are affecting youth, right? To help teachers understand how to connect with youth in a, in, in a way that speaks to them more powerfully, to help youth find their voice in a way that, that is akin to, to their culture. Um, all of this to me is wrapped up in the power of rhymecology and that's what I would tell somebody that if you, you're interested in finding out about it, like this is, the, this is the, the power that you'll unleash when you discover it. Back in my head I'm falling, they try to blackball them, come on and eyeball them. Is it bitter rather than sweet? So should I remove this filter and run bare feet? And prepare for a feast because I'm rare meat. And y'all just don't know, when will I be free from who I used to be? When will my grandma accept that Azor Vash is also me? Don't expect me to exit or go back and edit. I'm on an infinite expedition. Examples of exploration. Known from his life's education. On exclusive sickness. Sicker and slick with wickedness. Thicker than thick brain is limitless. Rhyme college is my fitness. And I exercise being lyrical because it's more about more than being vicious. It's more about being able to overcome pain. Jeff Walker is my witness. Rhymecology has always been part of our marriage. It's kind of weird. It's like, it, it's like I knew about rhymecology before I knew about my husband. To me, it's the essence of who Jeff is. It's the core of who he is. 
And secondly, it is his ability and desire to heal others. And so when you put that combination together, the counselor, the mentor, the healer with the music, that is actually everything of who he is. I was getting like in a lot of like trouble, yeah, getting in trouble. Mm -hmm. Like like unnecessary, unnecessary attention like coming in like from high school and like I just needed like an outlet, somebody to talk to like. I was working at a community mental health agency and I was assigned Christian's case. I would go into Gardena um, where he was living at the time, came in and he was just getting a hard time from his caregiver and I remember the day like he had his head down. He never, he didn't lift his head for a couple of days when I came and then I kind of stood up to your aunt. Remember I kind of said something to her and then I just saw Christian's head just raised. Like I still remember his head just picking up like this and he's like, someone's got my back. Yo, what's up, Jeff Walker in the building. Of course, I'm not Jeff Walker, I'm KRS-One. And Rhymecology is what we're talking about here. Excellent word, Rhymecology, Rhyme Ecology. Rhyme Ecology, that word ecology, hitting off with rhyme. I'm not even gonna get into what ecology actually goes into, but imagine putting rhyme in front of that. The person behind that camera is trying to stretch your head out with hip hop as therapy, as healing, hip hop beyond entertainment, hip hop as something that you can actually grow and develop from. That's what we're all about. That's what this movement is about. So I commend my man, no doubt. That's why I'm here on this video. So I've never been socked or pushed. If I lived in the water and hate, had eight arms, I'd be an Okay, this is uh, in, in, in Spanish. Don't smoke is no fuma, no fuma. This looks like a mountain lion, but it's really a fuma. If I was beating somebody and I had to explain to them what rhyme college is, I'd be like, you know rhyming? You know psychology? Rhymecology, dog! <laughs> I mean, it's in the name. It's, you know, that's part of his brilliance. I want you to introduce yourself to the group, to me, in a rhyme. Doesn't have to be anything like what I just did. Just do you in whatever form you feel, but as long as you're trying to rhyme with it. I'm the kind of me I can be asked to be by me and thee. Coming from a place so free, that's key. Mm. So just look, I'm only and really just honest because I'm not a tonic, only chronic, and sometimes I can be sonic and frantic, but not mantic. Not mantic. <laughs> All right, not mantic. All right, give it up. Breaking the ice. <clears throat> so you had a you had a string a string going with the me's and the we's and the freeze. Yeah, no, 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 it was great. It's cool. That's what we're, we're going to be doing stuff like that. When you said, now look, I, in my head, I was waiting for, because after that was now look, and then you said something about being honest, you know, open and honest like a book. Like I was feeling like there was going to be a book coming because you emphasized look. But otherwise, like, boom, you got me. Nice. Thank you for sharing. Working with others, it's a nice reminder because as I'm doing what comes very naturally to me, other, uh, others are gaining from it. And it comes like, you know, like it comes naturally to me to help and say, oh, you know, this rhyme might be better here. And how can you better say this and that? And, and, and when I see their reaction, you know, usually if I have a coaching session, you know, it goes an hour or so. And, you know, I pretty much go in blind, like, okay, what do you want to talk about? And then they give me some lyrics and right there in the moment, I'm reading over them, helping fixing things. My first time seeing him, I was, uh, I was introduced to him through the workshop. Um, I was in high school at the time, so it was like 2008, 2009, 2009, I would say. And Marisol Hot was explaining, coming to the classroom, telling people, you know, go to their workshop and I saw him and then, when I seen him spit his like his piece, his like the one words that stuck to my head, I put matches in my mouth to spit a flame. I was like, oh, that's dope as hell. <laughs> I was almost born in Indonesia. In fact, my first words were in Indonesian. Mao ini, meaning I want 
whatever I was looking at. I don't know what it was. <laughs> After being born in Marin, I moved right to Indonesia for a year and then Singapore for four years and then Argentina for two years and then Dubai for two years. <laughs> it's funny because I have a poem called I was writing and then I and, I and I do this thing where I go way back and I'm like, I was writing before the Paleolithic, before sages and mystics, before the clumps were craving gravy and biscuits. How long you been writing, Jay? And so I get the crowd all into it. So I just had to laugh at that. When did I start writing? I started actually writing short stories, probably about sixth grade. Sixth grade, my English teacher said I was gonna be a great writer one day. I wrote a choose your own adventure story that you could go A, B, C, D, a bunch of different ways. I wrote a story about who ate the cupcakes on Thanksgiving. We had a bunch of family friends over and I just went down in my room and I just did this story about who ate the cupcakes and how each person was a suspect or whatever. Very first thing that I can remember is stream of consciousness. And it was an environmental little book that we made in sixth grade. And I was, so those were my three first pieces. I heard America's Most Wanted by Ice Cube, Gangstar, Step Into the Arena, and Too Short, a couple of people like that, and it just, so ninth grade, it just, just took over. Never, never, never put on a tie-dye shirt again. So I just really started listening to West Coast rap, West Coast hip hop, Too Short, Mac Mall, uh, Young Black Brother Records, uh, E-40, all, everyone who was in the Bay Area. So I was super into that gangster rap too, Spice One, NWA, like heavy stuff. I can see why my mom probably didn't like that part. Then um, I moved to Paris. Uh, I lived with my dad where I was introduced to East Coast rap. And I heard a song by Nas and Cool G Rap called Fast Life, where they went back and forth trading bars and trading lines. They had all these rhymes falling in all these different places, playing off of each other. And I was like, oh my God, that is amazing. And I started, I copied down all the words and started to write them, you know, I just copied them down and looked at where the things were falling. And so that was about age 17. And then I just fell in love with, I started to study the art of the rhyme. But it was around that time where I started to write my own little things, you know, and very simple in the start. J JT, you know, I'm J, one, two, three, JT in the place to be, whatever, just something really simple. Started trying them out on friends who laughed at me and, uh, you know, but I just continued writing every single day and everything I wrote I thought was getting better and I thought it was good, even though it really wasn't at the time, but you couldn't tell me that. And then the actual stage, I had zero dollars in the bank in 2001. Um, I tried my hand at a, at a uh, corporate type job doing IT, hated it, hated it. Six, lasted six months. Uh, and then I went and interned at Good Vibe Records. I had a friend who was working there and I interned there for just like a summer, I would say. And I remember I had zero dollars in the bank because I was, had a, I was gonna have a date. And I went, I was like, ah, I got nothing for you. Can't, can't take you out. But around that time, I was still writing and kind of rapping and then and then a guy said hey have you ever checked out the poetry lounge what's that they do spoken word and i was like mm, what's that <laughs> you should go check it out i went down there and i saw a bunch of people doing their poetry but also there was this hip-hop flavor there was a dj there and i just fell right in love i went back the very next week with a piece that i wrote and it went really well you know, when I reminisce and think back, it feels like I used to fit in to this and to that. But when I look closer, I hear everyone laughing, saying, listen to that. Maybe that's why I'm scared of this mic and being dissed in a rap. Because as I get older, people are colder, and I feel like I'm missing the match. They could light someone's life just enough to gain their ear. You see, even if my fame wasn't here, I still feel past pain in here. Because I haven't found a way to cure it. Maybe you dedicate your life to churches. Or maybe you think religious worship is worthless. But either way, we gotta figure out what our purpose on this earth is. 
<laughs> Trust me, I live hip hop. And I know real hip hop's not about a wristwatch. It's not about all the Don and Chris pop. And it's definitely not about MCs that wear more makeup than Rick Fox. <laughs> See, I thought that shit was about spitting until your lips lock. Get your mind ready to lift off, even if that means your shit soft. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sometimes I get pissed off, and I think of hip-hop as a race car that needs a pit stop to be filled with reality, actuality, and spirituality. I spent the last 10 years trying to find who's Jeff. But when I find me, am I going to trade it all in just to be most deaf? Give up on my dreams because my fridge has got no toast left? And the only rappers with bread are the ones that boast best? You know, the ones that did a whole CD about how they smoke, says? Fuck a mic check. This is my hope check. This is my hope check. That's Eminem, little brother, boy. Oh, boy. How does it feel in visiting that? Emotional, a little bit. It feels emotional. Like visiting a long lost friend. And it's funny that all the lines came back. That was the first piece I ever wrote. And there was a lot of angst in there. And a lot of things that I still feel today, actually, uh, as I was saying it, hip-hop should be filled with spirituality, actuality, and reality, because that's what I'm trying to fill myself with. Amazing how many things you write that don't make it onto your albums and performance pieces. A lot of kids today think you just write and then you just put it on an album and then you put it out on Spotify or Bandcamp, but it's like, no, you got to go through a lot before you get to your final product. So I heard about this place, Poetry Lounge on Fairfax and Melrose. And then I had to go like candlelight. But maybe if I was listening to Job ja Rule, then I could handle this right. Maybe I'd have a better understanding of vandals with spite. And every time I choked in front of the Poetry Lounge, I wouldn't want to strangle this mic. Showed up there. And I just fell in love the first time I went there. But I didn't hear many people that were spitting the way that like I liked to spit and liked to listen to. You know, they were poets and they were poets and they were expressing themselves. And I was like, yeah, I gotta see that. And there was a few. Omari uh, Hardwick was definitely one who had dope rhymes and poetics. My man NQ. But then there was Sekou the Misfit. Jay Walker's commitment to writing is endless. When I talk about, you know, what drives me being the love for this art form, right? The love for, love, the love for the spoken word. If we were to peel away our layers of flesh and bone, if we could lift up our blood cells, cast off our chemistry and burrow beneath our neurons, what we would find us all to be at our core. Is vibration. It's most recent manifestation is spoken word poetry, but it started in hip hop, started in, in rhyming. It started with a love for words and like he shares that with me. Our cells keep our score. Our music is alive. Our voice hungers for harmony. This guy's winning national poetry slam championships, but I am feeling his rhymes. Not just his poetics, I'm feeling the way he's rhyming four or five different syllables. And I'm not seeing many other people do that. And you know, his stage presence was, you know, ridiculous. Here's how Jay Walker and I started bonding. He was a student of the art form. And it didn't matter. You could be Kooji Rap, you could be KRS whoever, common, but you could also just be Sekou Andrews or Sekou the Misfit at that time. Where we intersect was our love of the rhyme, I think. At that time, I didn't have that stage presence. I didn't have that, the, as the memorization skills yet. I didn't, I didn't have it, but what I had was the writing. And so I think he saw that and I saw that in him and eventually, like, we started rocking on the same stages. We just always connected through the rhyme. And the bombs bursting in air. And the pages from your history textbook mysteriously no longer there. It's what I am. 
and he would come up and like he would dissect my joints on a level that was like, yo, you've been studying. You know, I never forget like there was one time Jay, <laughs> Jay came to me and he was like, yo, your rhyme structure, like this is how you know you're talking about a, 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 prof a technically proficient student and master of the craft. He was like, yo, your rhyme structure and your, the, the, the complex multisyllabic compound rhyme structure that you had in this piece called The Lesson was ill. And he was like, the way you said, and he started spitting it to me. He started spitting my rhyme. And we're not talking about a simple rhyme. He was like, it was like, uh, I feel like I should have my own book in the Bible. Perhaps it saves you. Turn now to chapter one, verse one, book of Seku. Let it take you to places beyond hard and cursing, to soothe scars and hurting, to prove God is working in mysterious ways, curious ways. Keep my furious days from consuming me in a furious blaze, cause I keep hearing this rage bubbling within, covering the grins and smothering the winds. The trouble is the man standing in the way of me and my destiny. Half of me is already at the finish line, waiting for the rest of me, tasting every recipe, simmering the broth and squeezing lemon in the sauce. And please and women at a cost and end up swimming till I'm lost. But luckily, I saw Slim up in the spot and his words were, remember, to give in is not to give up. He told me to surrender. He said it won't be easy, but don't let it make you hard. And like he just kept, I, that's just the beginning. And like I'm listening to this cat going, yo, you just damn near spit that verbatim. And that's a complicated ass rhyme structure. Like I was honored on a level that is different than somebody coming up and saying, hey, good job, I like your poem. Like this cat was like, y'all, let me break you down in ways that you haven't even understood yourself to be broken down in. Like, that's a commitment. That's a level of a commitment that I see in him, I saw in him 15 plus years ago when we first started connecting on the scene, and he still has. My last release, Seiko Andrews and the String Theory, he, I, I, I was looking forward to the Jay Walker thoughts on the album because I knew it was going to be more than, yo, it was dope, I love this track. Like he broke, he sent me a text. It was like, this line, ill. The way you did the, the, the multi slavic part of this, ill. The way you flipped this concept. And as an artist, like that's what you want. Because when you think about it, we sitting in the lab in the dark in our room by ourselves going, woo, this is fire. I think this is fire. I think everybody's going to love this. But we don't know, right? We don't know until we get out there and we start spitting it. And then we can go months, if not years, spitting it, and people don't ever come up to you and, and yo, I mean, all they do is, good job, good job, good job, I really liked it, right? They don't give you like that detailed input. But Jay is that cat that I can count on to be like, yo, when you said this line that was ill, and I'll be like, you got that? You, oh, I knew somebody was gonna get that. But what we had in common was the love of creating intricate rhymes, with vulnerability, that's where the spoken word comes in that hip hop is missing. They don't, there's not enough vulnerability in hip hop. As I started to hear the vulnerability that these great poets had, I think the connection is the, the, the passion for the pen and, and, and the art of the rhyme, but with, but with that poet sensitivity. This dude is walking around with his notepad constantly, like, I'm a, I'm a student of the game. I'm hearing rhymes in everything. See, I can't, I'm just rhyming all, I'm, not, I'm already rhyming like Jay Walker. I'm a student of the game. I hear rhymes in everything. No matter what people are saying, I'm gonna find a way to slay, you know, like. <laughs> but that's how he is, man. And I, and I love that about him. And I think that that's what makes Rhymecology so, uh, so powerful is that, like, it's the level of specificity. It's the level of respect for the art form that when I'm, when I'm reading, reading his books, when I'm looking at his curriculum, like I'm going, this ain't a cat, this ain't a newbie. This is a student of the game, a student of the art form that understands it intimately and knows how to help it teach you to be a better version of yourself. And that's what he's about and that's what I'm about. So that's why we stay kindred spirits. Ooh, 2007, 219. When I tune in the cannons, I get a heavenly vibe. Listen, son, I recommend the salmon at French 75. I'm the canon's resident poet, y'all. Well, I have a question. I'll ask Steve. He's the resident know-it-all. Hi, I'm here with Jay Walker, of course. He is the master of verse. He is the official poet of the Loose Cannons VTV. Stevie, let's face it, Jay Walker's in, uh, evoked, provoked, thrown down such beautiful verse for us. And you know verse. You know, I like to write poetry. I like to compose. But when I hear Jay Walk's poetry, it makes me want to be exhilarated to the next level. Is it in the line of the great haikus, Confucius? Would you put it in the same category, profound thought? Stevie, let's face it, when Jay Walk throws down, all action stops. 
and we must listen to the words, to the wisdom of Jay Walk, but it's the flow. You know, I call Michael Phelps Flow Master P. Right. I call Jay Walk Flow Master W. There it is, the W. The W. The two W right here. Yeah, yeah. Jay Walker, the man with the words. Love it. Got the words. Yes, it's powerful stuff. Jay Walker, uh, first of all, just a, a fascinating, relentless character. And I first encountered Jay on the phone. I called up and I'm like, hey, I got a poem. This is Jay Walker, the resident poet. Doesn't even know who I was talking to, but I'm like, this is, you know, this is my line. Like, this, this is my airways too. Like, this is, this is where I express. And I said, okay, that's, you know, that's, that's interesting. I, you know, I, I, I just, I, I don't know you. And he was talking to me like he knew me. It's a whole new bunch. I got to prove myself all over again. That's the story of my life, man. Like, this pen has had to be proved so many different times in so many different arenas to so many different people. So even after becoming the resident poet, I had to start all over again. Well, I then was the producer with Chris Myers and Hartman and Vic. And so Jay, who had been listening to them, for the stretch that I wasn't producing, but I was on the air at night, he was talking to another producer. So when he called me, he either assumed that I was that producer or knowing Jay, he just figured, all right, I mean, if I'm truly the poet, I mean, that'll probably get me somewhere. So he says that and I go, all right. And so I said, hey, I got a poem where I'm gonna introduce Chris Myers to the canons. And I just said, all right, what do you got? He goes, no, 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 but it's not like that. I don't just wanna go on and talk about the guys. I've got something I prepared. And so the, the poem not only was introducing Chris to the loose cannons in that environment, but it also encapsulated things that they had just talked about. I said, all right, this sounds really interesting. Now, most people have something they want to say in their head, but rarely do you hear somebody say, I've got something prepared. Okay, Jay said that. I said, all right, well, what do you got? Before I could even say, what do you got? He just starts giving me the first verse of his poem. And I'm thinking, and I take notes during the show, all right? And he's reciting me back what just happened over the course of the last hour and a half on the show. And I go, all right, this guy's clearly been listening. He clearly knows what's going on. I go, all right, all right. You're definitely the poet. I got you. So I write up there, Jay Walker, AKA the poet. And immediately Myers and Hartman both know it and I hear they're kind of wrapping up with somebody else and they go, all right, something really special coming up and they actually take a break and they come back from the break and they go directly into Jay's call. And he, I mean, he just, he kills it is, you know, the term you hear often, but I can only say that there was a buildup to it that would probably be unnecessary for most callers on the radio. You just don't normally have that, you know, up next we're going to talk to some dude you've never heard of, like that just, that, you know, or we're just going to interact with some random caller. No one's really going to say that, but Steve really sold it, that it was something. And when he came back, it was just, it was the perfect, it was the perfect stamp in the final segment of the show. Everyone, I need a girl with self-confidence who won't ruin my world with cockiness, one who can appreciate my compliments and it wouldn't hurt if she liked common sense. Common sense, the rapper, but... Yeah, I was putting it out there, what, who I, who, what I wanted. And at the same time, Jilly was putting out what she wanted. And it was like the two musical guides connected them. I had come, I'd been coming and going to LA for um, up until that point about six years. I was uh, put, uh, part of my own record company, Warrior Gold Music. I would put on these big nights for other artists. I was doing my own thing. I was hitting the poetry lounges, hitting the bars. I was, uh, I, w I was going out a lot. I was going out a lot. I wasn't tied down relationship type for most of my life. I did have a relationship prior to Jilly, which <clears throat> I can hardly remember now, but I do remember that it was a bit volatile. So I came out of this unhealthy relationship I wrote a piece called Therapy, um, where I played both sides of the relationship, as in the a therapist and a client, and it got a lot of buzz at my work. Man, I don't need no kind of therapy. I don't even drink, and smoking weed is rare for me. Oh, well, that's cool. You know, I'm just here to help you with clarity, and maybe we could clean up some of that vulgarity. And someone at my work was like, hey, I perform at these showcases. Maybe you should come down and, you know, do a poem. 
It's ancient or new age. Because there's a fine line between a prophet and a true sage. A few fade into the essence of light. While some are in overdrive and others are just resting for life. This, this was before these poems were featured. I was doing poems in between sets as the band is changing and, and I'm like, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, I'm up here. One of the places I did it at was a Songs Alive showcase. I didn't know at the time was run by this Australian-Italian dynamo named Jilly Moon. You could say that. I was on the internet before it was the internet. I, w I think I was uh, one of the first artists to have a website and create a distribution and a following on the internet before artists thought that they could really do that. So I kind of paved the indie way from a digital point of view. And you know, we start to see each other every once in a while and I was always in the corner with my beret scripting a, scripting a little rhyme in the moment. And then I, she'd get up on stage, kick off her shoes, just slam on the piano with this beautiful voice with these songs. And I had been at a lot of these places, but I really never cared about singer-songwriters that much. I was more into, obviously, hip-hop, more into people making intricate rhymes and punchlines, and so singer-songwriters were boring to me. Um, but not her. <laughs> And he happened to be in one of the shows uh, that I think one of my bookers put, put him in, I involved in. So she did this song called Spaceship, where she said, you know, she was tr going back, traveling in time. And, I, you know, that also spoke to my kind of like metaphysical quantum physics things that I really love to think about, time travel, stuff like that. And I, so I just went up to her and I was like, man, I'm like, that was amazing. I love that song about time travel. And we started talk. I just was talking about me and what I liked. And then she was like, yeah, you know, I've seen you in the corner writing. And at some point, I think of the man, he came up to me and he was asking me about my song Spaceship. And he, he knew all the like esoteric, meaningful, he kind of got my song. So I knew that this guy was just not like an ordinary, you know, musician or a poet, but he had some substance. So, and I, I never thought I would date someone in the music business. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. One day we said, uh, do you want to write a song together? And we said, yeah, great. And so we got on a call to write a song, actually to organize writing a song. We never talked about the song. <laughs> we just talked about each other. I guess probably a week or two, maybe a week goes by or something. And I'm back at my bachelor pad and on Park La Brea. I think, I think we sent an email and, I, and I'm like, hey, let's do that song, you know, amongst other windows and other emails popping up. I'm like, let's talk about that song. I'm like, I'm like I'll give you a call. This was at like seven o'clock. At 10 p.m., I see an email come in and she says, are you going to call or what? <laughs> so grab the phone right away. We start talking about 10 p.m. We talked till 2 a.m. and barely talked about music. Didn't even talk about our songs. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we, either of us thought that we would go from like wanting to write a song to what we've actually established now, which is, I mean, it's better than writing songs. Of course, we love writing songs and we still do. Ideas, lines, rhymes. We were at the Fox Sports Grill in Westlake, which had just opened up. They were having a big grand opening, and they wanted us to come out. And, you know, I'm looking out at the crowd all day. I'm kind of interacting with people that are listeners, and I'm on the air a little bit with the guys, and no one there is really, it's not like the, the audience interacts with them that are live, that are there when they're doing the show. That's, that's it's a pretty rare thing. And I'm sitting next to this, this kind of young guy. Man, he's dressed smooth, though. Turns out he's kind of producing the show, and it's, Sam Batesh. And then I'm like, hey, nice to meet you. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm Jay Walker, Jay Walker the poet. And he goes, oh yeah, yeah, you, you've called in before. 
And I go, yeah, I wrote, I, you know, I'm just writing something. And I go, you, you want to hear it? Before I know it, I've got Jay kind of next to me. And I don't even know that he realizes what's going to happen, but he's next to me while the guys are back on the show. And I have actually slipped a note to Hartman that Jay's here and he's got something special for us. So this time, instead of going to break and coming back with Jay, Hartman just says, all right, ladies and gentlemen, we got something very special. Someone that was here in the crowd today, but that you know very well. Uh, we've got Jay Walker, the poet, and he's got something very specially prepared for us. So Jay, I, I, you know, at that moment, I, he's a natural performer that way, and certainly on this stage, but you could tell he wasn't exactly ready. He was sort of confiding in me that he had this, but he was ready to go. And we, and I, I had a mic ready to go, and I handed it to him, and he was performing not just for the guys there, which is daunting enough in and of itself. It feels like an audition, almost something you would see on The Voice. So I get up there, I do my piece. I said something like, uh, the Harvard Westlake Grill, is this the hot spot? Damn, after this, we're all sharing a bottle of red with Bob Scott. And they went, like, we just said that like one minute ago, Bob Scott, you know. And so, so, I, I, so I was in with that and, and their families were there and, and something about being careless. I just hope my daughter one day is as cute as Paris, who was Steve Hartman's daughter, mentioned Chris Myers' wife in the rhyme. And it, so I got, I got in there after that. Jay Walker, he's our resident poet. He always gets it right on the nose for Fox Sports Radio. Something that happened last year mm -hmm. was I, I got to write for the Black Eyed Peas. First off, it's been like a year and a half in the making. And, you know, I'm so happy that we finally got to execute the NRA joint. Thank you for pinning it, dreaming it up, and trusting the vision to execute. Mm -hmm. Yo, this dude, write better rhymes. He, he doesn't just have shirts about it. He lives it and, be, and he's all about it. The mm -hmm. lyrics, the whole freaking like rhymeology. You like one of the best MCs, bro. <laughs> I swear to you, bro. And poets that I've met. You may not know, but you had something to do with that. Yeah. Uh -huh. My wife was working at uh, Will I Am's tech company. Right. So Will, Will was looking at the copy and he was like, man, this is whack. Mm -hmm. He's like, I wish someone knew Seku. My little, my little wife who didn't know him. Oh, <laughs> my husband knows him. So then we reached out to you. Yeah. But of course, I wrote a little something at the same time. Right. And so we both, so she submitted both, not putting any names on anything. Right. And he was like, yo, that's the one I want to go with. Mm -hmm. And it was mine because it had it was something about the thirty, the thirty, the the, 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 the headphones that looked like the record. And oh yeah, yeah. About, mm -hmm. know, and I was getting into something about the spinning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember. That. I remember that. It was a dope concept. And yeah. and so then one day I was just there at the office, mm -hmm. like, oh yeah, I wrote the copy for this. He's like, oh, that was you. And we're sitting in this in, in his office, and you know, no one could get five minutes of his time. Mm -hmm. Workers are waiting for, you know, weeks to get him to sign off on this and that. Uh, and I was just like. Yo, can I spit something? <laughs> like it, it, in this kitchen surrounded by all these people. I'm like, yo, can I just spit something? And I just spit a poem off the top right there. Uh -huh. He's like, okay. And they brought someone else over. Yeah. Brought someone else. Oh, this guy, he does something. And then I happened to have this piece that I wrote called Race, mm -hmm. which every line was filled with acronyms for the word race. Reality is a circus, essentially, so I remove all crutches existentially. I represent ambience, confidence, and empathy. That's why I once revived a community elementary, because the rude assholes couldn't even teach. So I reprimanded all classes, and each kid rose above common experiences, busted through the concrete. What you think this is? See, that's a, that's a student right there. Like that's a that's a concept that's way more complicated than most cats would tackle. <laughs> you four, know what I mean? four letters, right? Four letters, <laughs> yeah. not, not two letters for an acronym. Most cats would tap out. They'd be like, you know what? Let me just let me just rap about my car. And then he just like hit me up, and he was like, "Yo, can we use that for the Black Eyed Peas album?" We want to film a video for it. Okay. And so they brought in like a hundred kids and they were all reciting my, they've been calling, but they never really answer and all, you know, and yeah, yeah. the black eyed peas are in there and everyone's walking around. And so I had this amazing moment where they filmed the video and all of that. And it all started because 
number one, um, you know, taking that initiative, yeah. spitting for That's him, right. feel like, like, you know, I could also be that shy in a back poet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that time I was like, I'm feeling myself. Yeah. And I'm going to yeah. go right yeah. here in this place. That's right. And that led to one of the greatest experiences I ever had. It was a healthy competition with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, I'm going up against Sekou. Cool. That's right. I better get, I better man, get it. Yeah. Right. And, That's and, it, man. And so I'm, I'm like, and we had two hours to do it. This is Will I am, of course. He's like, yo, I need to get this out in two hours. Yeah. And so Sekou's like, you know, he's, he's speaking. He comes off stage. He's like, okay, let me try to do something real quick. Did something really dope. I did something really dope. We put it in, and it was came out to be one of the great stories I felt. But you know. We were related in that. Dude, still sharp and still. Like I said, you want to be the best, you surround yourself by the best. You surround yourself by those cats that make you go, I got next. You know what I mean? Mm. And that's the thing. Like, that's the cat. When I saw people ask, yo, who you, you know, who your peers, who your, who your, uh, your inspiration and everything, a lot of times it's just like my boy or, or like some poet on the scene. You know, I might even go to an open mic. Like, if I'm struggling, I got writer's block, I'll go to an open mic. And it's not necessarily, sometimes it might be like, oh, I need to, I want to hear poetry. I want to be, you know, inspired. But sometimes it might just be like, I just need to hear somebody that's dope so I can be like, yo, I'm dope too. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because just that that competition is what will charge me up to be like, yo, I'm coming after you. I'm coming after your spot. Even if it's just, you know, my boy's spot. And I love that. Like you were like, yo, I'm going to submit my joint because Seku submitted his joint. And now I'm like, that's with you. Now I'm coming after you, homie. You know what I'm saying? You took the Seku spot. Hey, Will. Hey, Will. Hey, Will, I got next. <laughs> So we met at the Mint, November 12th, 2005. And this is another one of the Jilly Moon events, Songs Alive. So people are always coming up to her and she's kind of always being pulled in many different directions because she's like, she's the spotlight. She's the star of this and the project manager running the whole thing. And so we're sitting there eating and I remember asking her, I, I remember asking her, I said, I said, how's your stomach? You know, you know, how, you know how's the food basically? How, how, how's your tummy? How's your stomach doing? And she said, it has butterflies in it. And I remember that, like that just floored me. Her vulnerability. Like she's the, uh, you know, she's the one man show, like I was saying, but then to stop it and to uh, have that self-awareness and the honesty and the vulnerability to say that in that moment was big for me. Um, I knew she was special. The connections like talking about Dante and talking about the universe and talking about deep and meaningful things about where does humanity come from. And, and, and I'd always been talking about emotions in my songs. After that date, uh, then we hung out a couple of times, went to some movies, held hands. You know, we were very, as it was very PG, just like, like we we're just getting to know each other from the inside out, as opposed to the other way, which is many people's history, um, mine included, before her. When we got together and started dating, it was just kismet, and then it just organically grew to wanting to get married. Uh, we actually dated for a whole year. We did the whole um, engagement for a year, I mean. We still went slow. I went slow. I'm, this is going to be different. So we're in Virginia Beach. So I'm sitting on the beach writing a rhyme and she's just like, oh, that's normal. And then she, but she, you know, at that time she started as, you know, what are you writing? Oh, I'm like, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Writing, writing. And she's like, all right, looking at the beach. We go for a little swim, come back. I say, hey, I got something I want to read you. And she's like, just come out of the ocean, like, you know, all right, what, all right, what, what, what do you have this time? You know, what, what, are you, what are you talking about this time? I knew I couldn't bring you into my world because I had a sneaking suspicion it would be our world. 
and I didn't even contemplate a one night stand because I knew our first night stand would be my last night stand and I couldn't stand to have you stand by another man's night stand. Understand? This poem's gonna be too real for silly similes and metaphors. It took me one month to write, but 31 years to get ready for. And I don't need to decide on spoken word, poetry, or rap. I'll just do one of each and then recite them to you while we plan our lives on a beach. This speech is gonna have to be in rhyme because that's what I do best. And until I met you, that was the only way I could get through stress. There was no three month test. I knew we were two peas in an iPod just by how you cocked your head and responded to my nod. My God must have hooked up with yours and said it's time to end their relationship wars because the last time ins I inspected my heart, you're the one I've been saving it for. I love you because it doesn't matter who makes the bread and who cooks. And every time I ask, have you seen that movie? You say, no, but I read the book and the book is always better than the movie. So you must be a Shakespeare first edition. I want every copy, I want every rendition. Look, I know the crowd out here would, they'd get loud if I threw in some F-bombs, but the only finger I associate with you is the one on your left palm. That's right. I went from daydreaming about the best Friday night to daydreaming about being with you for the rest of my life. Because when I look in your eyes, I see my future. And there's no Marty McFly that could make me back out of it. And these words are too important to make a rap out of it. That's why these words are being spoken. They're carefully chosen because you care for me. And I'm frozen in time, just hoping this rhyme can even do my feelings justice. And if you don't get that I want to marry you, then my point just missed. Jilly, I'm sure it would be great to date you for life, but I'd rather make you my wife. Will you marry me? That was just the best. And in amongst all of it, it's, you know, touring, and um, performing, writing for our own albums. We sometimes collaborate on each other's albums and then writing for others. And that just hasn't ever stopped. Um, and now we have two children. I actually ended up having twins. And um, it's just, you know, it's just keeps on going. Terry Bradshaw, Kurt Menefee, and the NFL and Fox All-Stars are heading to Hawaii, Hawaii. a local party with a special enhanced broadcast. More mic players than ever before. That's gonna be great. Super Bowl week kicks off. The 2011 Pro Bowl Sunday, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, only on Fox. <laughs> the show resonates most for me with when Pat O'Brien was the host with Hartman and Vic. Right it depends. Now, well, no, I don't think so. No. And Pat is a legend in news, a legend in sports, a legend in infamy. I'm sorry, I was late. I was, uh, here's what honest to God happened. I was stopped by the sales department to meet a client. Yeah. Here's Pat actually on my last day producing at Fox. And Pat and I have an incredible friendship. And so when Pat joined the show, I mean, we really didn't even know what we were tapping into. Pat was, like I had mentioned, he's a legend in news, a legend in sports, a legend in infamy, just a legend in name alone, and a legend in entertainment, of course. And so Pat joins the show, and it's sort of redefined as the Loose Cannons with Pat O'Brien. Pat and I were so close, and he trusted me on, on almost everything. And much like I didn't know the first time that Jay called me, I didn't know, okay, Jay Walker, the poet, you know, all right. Pat didn't necessarily know that, and Pat had a way about him. If he thought you were coming on the show and you know really knew your stuff and you were there to maybe one-up the guys, Pat had a way of really knifing you. So now I've got the in, like Chris Myers knows me, and then they changed it up again. Chris Myers out, Pat O'Brien in. This isn't just a sportscaster, this is this is the guy, like, we grew up watching Magic and Larry. 
Like he was there. We want Jordan when he Jordan with hair. Like he was there. Like hanging, not only reporting but hanging out with them. Like this guy's legendary. So he comes on the show, and he's dwarfing pretty much everyone else because of his fame, and he's letting you know about it too. He's always name dropping, which which was <laughs> always name dropping. I am now the David Beckham. Like I'd be, I'd be making notes. Okay, that's one. That's two. That's like, but as he should, like you know, you're kind of a living legend, um, and you're now doing this AM radio show, and then there's this guy, this poet, me. So Jay called and I said, all right, well, you know, tell me what you what you got, and he was giving it to me, and I said, all right, just make sure Pat. Like, make sure we get Pat involved in it. I think he's going to love you. So Jay had done one on the air with the guys, and they did like it. But, they, but Pat had never met Jay. So one day, we're in Burbank doing the show, and, and Jay texts me, and he goes, hey, you know, I'm in the neighborhood. If you, if you guys want me to come up. And I go, you know what? Come on up. I have no idea right now necessarily where we're going to put you in, but come on up, and, and we'll see what happens. So... He comes up and he's, he just goes in the other room and, he, and he's writing things down and he comes in and he goes, I, I think I got something. And I said, all right, you know, let's see. I, let, me, let me see how Pat feels. And I go, you know what? Just come with me. Just come in the room with me. Can I go in? Yeah. yeah. This is Big Sam. Jay Walker is here, boy. Jay Walker. Jay Walker. A nice piece that I think Pat O'Brien's going to enjoy. What's up, Jay? So got Jay Walker here, the poet. Now, of course, Hartman and Vic stand up and they're like, oh, Jay, what's up? And, you know, I mean, they love him and they've known him for years. Well, like I told you, Pat is going to take that moment to kind of feel it out himself. And so, you know, he's kind of looking and he goes, okay, huh. Jay Walker, the poet, huh? He goes, all right, so we're about to come back from break. And he doesn't, he's not really necessarily talking to Jay that much in the break. He's waiting for the segment to start. So the segment starts, and Pat goes, all right, everybody, very special moment. We've got Jay Walker, the poet here. Uh, all right, Jay, you know, I, I understand you're very special. You're a big deal. Well, here I am. What do you got? Most things are, they were about Pat, especially on that show. It kind of didn't really pay me much mind. And then... Um, they handed me the reins, they handed me the mic, and I went in. So with this one, with the Pat O'Brien piece, I did research. You know, I, I, I saw where he was born, I, I looked up, I, look, I just did a lot of research, because this one wasn't going to be in the moment. This one like had to be scripted correctly. It had to be funny though, and it had to be have a little edge. I was called into the studio to rap live. But I didn't think I'd be sitting next to that guy who apparently came out of a cave and invented the Fab Five. Yo, stand by, because the Cannon Show has never been tighter. Ever since they kidnapped that dude from the Insider. Pop said, Jay, you gotta make some money from rap. Well, Dad, I'm trying. We all can't access Hollywood like Pat O'Brien. For decades, he's had fans swooning. That's why he looks down on those uh, lowly hacks like Sam Rubin. I remember when the Cannons used to take a few calls, but now that's a rare occurrence, like celebrities being born in Sioux Falls. <laughs> Pat, this is your new reality. And the scary part is that Victor Brick is your new Mary Hart. I'm very smart, so writing this was an easy test, because I grew up watching Pat and Brent, so I can see BS on Channel 2, or right here. Now fans might fear that the gossip and tabloids could have severed your ego, <laughs> but that's impossible because you eat with Jordan and take private jets with the Beatles. Yeah. Now I've been doing this for years. I get mad joy when I write, but I should have been the white neighbor in Puff Daddy's Bad Boys for Life. Yeah. Pat, you're in hip hop too? Damn, the level of your fame? It's shocking. That's why we put up with the constant name dropping. And at the end, he puts a very special direct zing right into Pat, referencing his most infamous moment of all time. This is Jay Walker, roasting Pat O'Brien with fat flows, and I would have left this on your voicemail, but you know how that goes. And, and Pat, you know, kind of looks at him, and there's a moment where you don't know if Pat is incredibly upset with Jay, or if he's going to find it remarkably hysterical. That was a sensitive subject, because he had been basically kicked off the air for a voicemail that he had left on a, 
a, a, a young woman's, you know, cell phone, and um, it didn't paint him in a very good light, and it changed his career trajectory. So to drop that in there, but to do it without being like an, uh, without being a jerk about it, I think was key. And Pat lets it sit a beat, and Jay sits a beat, and and even I'm right on the other side of the glass wondering, all right, was this the worst mistake any of us ever made? <laughs> or was this really funny? And I was like, I was nervous. Oh, very wow. good, man. Very, very good. Next level that level. is, now that's top level. That's, that's top shelf. Right? And, and that was it. You just, you knew at that point, it was, you know, that the Jay Walker story was gonna continue. You know, it just, it lived on through the fabric of the loose cannons. Yeah, that's your best ever. That's the best, best ever? ever? Yeah, that's wow. a good one. Wow. Best ever. Now, do we Heavy get that on tape? We put that on the website? We got uh, right. Justin over here is recording it's all it. all good. That's and top level, man. Well, thank I'm you. honored. But because of my rhyme sickness, in a way, like <laughs> I could just look at any of the words and, 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 and create something around it. So it all starts with rhyming and then you can push it into other genres. I see someone else in here who I work with, Sarah, back there. I give it. And so she is not a rapper or you know, a spoken word artist, but the rhymes that we come up with are richer than just the normal end rhyme. My husband is a dreamer, but he's also, uh, he knows the right timing of things. So he's had this vision for a long time and he's starting to play it out in many different ways over the years. He's now attracting some of the, the most amazing players in, in the hip hop world and in fashion world and just in LA, in the business world. And so as he starts to build his Rhymecology Center, what, what I see will happen is it'll be an epicenter for everyone to come through the door and discover themselves in, in many different ways. He has a knack of, of reaching out to anybody. He has no, no, no shame, no fear. And they're like wearing his t-shirts and putting him on radio and talking about movement. What's important is, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of humility with Jeff and that's the piece. That's why it works because he's not there to go, well, I want to be famous or I want to do this because I want to be uh, a star. He, in fact, when we first met, I was like, oh my God, you're so like talented. He's like, I don't want a record deal. I don't want to be, you know, up there. You know, I don't want a Grammy award. I don't want that. He says, what I do is I'm building this program and that's what, who he is still today. And so everything that he does and he will touch um, will be about the higher mission. And so those who continue to get involved tap into that because that's what we need more in this world. We don't need any more celebrities. What we need are conscious healing, you know, of our humanity and, on, and of our world. So I'm going to stay married to him. The clock is ticking and I've, al I've always felt that. Just knowing that this is the one chance I have in this life. Knowing that this is the one life I have in this body, with this family, with this skill set, with this passion for what I do. While part of me is a real shy in the, in the back poet, part of me also knows like time is ticking. And so sometimes like I kick myself if I don't get up and take advantage of a situation. Um, and so a lot of my pieces are driven by like, this is it, this is our moment. Grab a hold of it, looking around at society, looking looking at not not just like you know urban plight and not not just that but also everyday people just with their own struggles with the job that i have working in the inner cities and then also being fortunate enough to live in the suburbs like seeing both sides there there's pain in both sides and just because this person's driving this certain car I look at them like they could be in just as much pain as the people I work with. I like to inspire both worlds if possible, and I, and I feel like I can do that with a foot in both. There is Rhymecology, the service, the, the curriculum, the books, the game, Jeff Walker, Jay Walker, the poet, that he can also live separately. As for me, I want to use my skill, my talent, my writing 
to help more people, to touch more people. And selfishly, yeah, I want, I want to have more songs out there, more songs on TV, you know, more songs in movies, and, you know, possibly create a platform like we used to have for Fox Sports, where I'm in there writing in the moment, doing wrap-ups, and taking those wrap-ups to, to, to conferences, to, to, to business conferences, where I'm providing a wrap-up of what has happened, but in rhyme. That's the kind of stage that I'm going to bring my writing to. Because again, I think it goes back to have a skill and talent, communication, a way to communicate, as well as a service. You can put those three together and you should be able to make money from it, right? I think that is the next evolution of where all of this is going. Don't be lazy and don't underestimate what you have. I had a lot of chances that I didn't capitalize on, partly because I probably thought I wasn't good enough. Maybe part of me thought it was a, gonna be a passing phase. I had a line, I won talent shows on Crenshaw that not one of my friends saw. And it's true, I was winning these talent shows and so I, you know, people would give me a card and hey, I'm from this label, I'm from this, and I didn't even call them. What was I doing? I was busy going to the bars. So I do, I think there's some, some regret there because when I exploited my talents, they were very accepted. They were, very, they were, they were welcomed, whether it was a poetry lounge or a open mic or a competition, but I didn't think of it as it was gonna be a business. I didn't think of it like, oh, you can write for people. You know, you can write songs for people. You can be a, a ghost writer. You can be a lyricist. I, I, I came into that later. And, and I wish that I could tell the young Jay Walker, the poet, to be more business savvy, be ready to take that on instead of brushing it off. I, brush, I, I would brush it off often, whether it was self-doubt, fear, laziness, I don't, combination of them all. But that's why I'm still burning, that's why it's, it's because now I, 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 it took a little while to realize, you know, how these words can be used in so many different mediums with, and, and, and even some of the great artists out there, you know, my writing is actually upon that level. Maybe I don't, I'm not going to be that rapper. I never, actually never wanted to be that rapper. That could be part of it. I didn't want to be that rapper touring, but I want to use my words. So that's probably why I gravitated towards spoken word and songwriting rather than label chasing and performing. But the young Jay Walker, the poet, could definitely um, use that advice, I would say. I still don't want to be that touring artist, to be honest, but I still and want to and will be using my words to, to, to make a life, to make, to make a living, to create a brand and to touch and heal people, whether it's writing for someone else or whether it's creating my own brands and merch and things like that. I'm still gonna be using my words and creativity, but you know, the drive isn't to you know, be the, the be in that little 1% of people that are, are, you know, trying to make a living from just writing, uh, you know, performing songs. Writing, yes, but I want to, um, yeah. Making this film, it's been a great reminder, number one. It's been great to hear from people who I used to work with, whether it was in a creative space or in a, in a therapeutic space, but it's, it's, it's a great reminder hearing from different worlds and different people who all have achieved, you know, high levels of success. It's just been a fantastic to hear what they have to say about how what I did touched them or affected them or little stories that 
that, that they might have said that I didn't remember or hearing from their point of view while I was over in the corner writing and, and you know what was going on over here. It's a great reminder of what I've done is not insignificant because as an artist, parent, husband, person, we all have those times where everything's messed. You just feel like everything's messed up and maybe one thing comes on and then you start to pile them on and then you get to the point where you're thinking, what is even the point of this? I've never been able to do this enough and I haven't, I'm not good enough at this. I'm not good enough at that. And I think that, you know, seeing, seeing this through other people's eyes has, it's been, it's, it's been therapeutic for me actually and rewarding and a great reminder that I have a uniqueness and I have a some some something to give. We believe in oncology. We like it. This is Master Ace and I'm here to represent for Rhyme College. That's your best ever. That's the best, best ever? Yeah, that's wow. a good one. Best ever.